Hi, this is John Pettigrew, and you're listening to Talking Through My Hat, a podcast that explores bookish businesses, the fantastic people who create them, and what those people have learned. I'm a hat wearer, a recovering editor, and the creator of Future Proofs, enabling editors and authors to work better online. To find out more, visit wearefutureproofs.com or follow me on Twitter at John underscore Pettigrew. Welcome to this week's Talking Through My Hat. Today I'm talking with Joe Bottrell of Out of House Publishing. Having worked for Nature, Taylor & Francis and Cambridge University Press, Joe set up Out of House over 11 years ago to help academic and educational publishers to develop, edit and produce their content. So welcome to the podcast, Joe. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. How do you, I mean, I've given a quick brief intro there, but how do you describe Out of House to people who haven't heard of you before? Um, so we provide editorial and production services for busy publishers, uh -huh. which means we organize everything for them from commissioning and concept development right the way through to printing, ebook production and everything in between, really. So it's a it's a complete end to end solution. Some yeah. of our publishers take everything. Other publishers just kind of take little bits of the process and outsource that to us. Yeah. But um, yeah, we've been established for over 11 years and um, it's been going yeah. well. And, and you specialize in certain market sectors, don't you? That's right. Yeah. So um, our core markets are academic and education publishing. So we support um, some of the major academic publishers. Um, Taylor and Francis, Cambridge University Press, but also some small um, independent publishers as well. And that's a really interesting space at the moment. Yeah, excellent. So why did you first set up Out of House? I mean, as I said, you'd worked for, you know, the standard sort of standard publishing companies. You had a, a career going there. Why did you make the jump to, to set your own business up? Well, as, we, as we've said, I, you know, we mostly serve publishers of academic and education content. And back in um, 2007, I moved from my job as a production manager at Cambridge University Press mm -hmm. um, to start working in the West Country as a freelance project manager. Okay. Um, and that went well. And it soon became apparent to me that there was actually a gap in the market for a well-organized project management service. Mm -hmm. That bridged the divide between services provided onshore, uh, onshore, mm -hmm. and those that were delivered offshore. So, okay. you know, publishers were quite comfortable with outsourcing their typesetting to offshore vendors. Yeah. Um, but taking the step to prov to offshoring the complete package, mm -hmm. project management of a of a the production of a a book or a piece of content from manuscript, right the way through to final files or printed books for some publishers was just a step too far. And so yeah. we have been able to bridge that gap over the years and provide editorial and project management services onshore, so in the UK and in the US, um, and marry that up with the really good technology-led um, XML workflows that are delivered by vendors offshore. Yeah, so kind of being part of that global workflow was, kind of, was always part of the business for you. Yeah, right from the, right from the very beginning really so hmm. all through my career I've worked with vendors offshore and you know been part yeah. of a workflow where certain bits of work are done in the market so in in the UK or in the US and other bits of work are done offshore and it's really interesting to me how that dynamic and how that divide has moved over the years yeah. and how different publishers and different parts of the industry develop you know, differing levels of comfort with where their work is done and where different parts of the workflow are, are delivered from. So yeah. that's been um, that's been something that we've been able to support publishers in over the years. And uh, you know, some publishers we've helped them offshore more of their work. Uh -huh. Others want to keep more things onshore, and that's and that's great. So yeah. And so, how did you make the that jump from you know you were a freelancer, and how how did you make that step to oh I actually need to to insert myself into the global supply chain? So you need a little <laughs> bit more. A little bit more gravitas or something to go up to fit to do that. A little bit more gravitas, I like it. Um, well, it was it was a slow dawning, I suppose. I mean, I was I was freelancing for for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, but gradually we started to build up a team, and I was able to bring in colleagues that I'd worked with um, you know, earlier in my career, and really mm -hmm. good freelancers from other parts of the industry. And gradually we started to build a team. 
But I don't think it was really until kind of four, maybe even five years in that yeah. I really started to, to recognize that actually this was a business that had potential that you yeah. know, we'd actually built up some responsibility. We were starting to get staff and suppliers in the UK. And so from that point, I started to see it much more as a business that we needed to develop that had potential to grow. Yeah. And um, we started to get a bit more organized. <laughs> and uh, the the key um, change for me was I started to get some outside help. So I, from that point, I've always had some form of um, coaching or mentoring yeah. from from third parties and that's been really really helpful to me yeah that's really interesting because when you talk to people who've started business often some people it starts as a kind of a side project they have a day job and they'll do something on the side for a bit um and other people it, it's the big the all in the leap but this is the, this is kind of different isn't it you, you've you took a very gradual effect approach you know you had a goal of inserting yourself into the global supply chain um but it, it was it was stepwise and growing into that vision it was, yeah. I mean, I knew I knew there was a service that I could deliver in a freelance capacity. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite know or, or really recognise at the time what potential that had um, in terms of growing a business. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it, as I said, it was a, a, a slow dawning almost. Yeah. What what potential that was. Um, and you know, once once we realised that you know it was a business that had legs and there were lots of people out in the market that were looking for this kind of support yeah. um and that really to be successful uh, we needed to grow volume because you know like <laughs> many industries publishing works on tight margins yeah. and so we you know we needed to go for for rapid growth and get some some high volume um it was only once we realized that that we started to 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 grow the business more aggressively and start to put down some really firm roots and as you said um you know, expand out more globally and start to start to develop more with our offshore partners and that's been a really mm. important part of our growth yeah and you said that, you know as part of shaping the business stuff you you you, you see seeking out mentors and coaches and stuff i mean do, do you have a, a board or do you keep it a bit more casual than that i mean and how, where do you find these people to, to give you advice <laughs> well the first the first person i found i i kind of i went to a a, a business um kind of networking show in in Gloucestershire where we're based and I tentatively or well, timidly popped my business card in in um in somebody's pot and 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 that was a chap called Peter Doggett who's been really instrumental in helping me uh grow the business he has no um experience in publishing really yeah but um he's a local business coach yeah and uh, that's been really really transformative for us and he um runs we don't have a a, a formal board to answer your question um but peter runs um a group here in gloucestershire called exec board okay. um and that really takes that idea of a board that concept of a board and offers it to small and medium-sized businesses who are too small to have a board of their own if you like mm -hmm. so we're a group of um of business people who come together once a month we run our meetings very much like a like a board meeting mm -hmm. you have to submit papers and share our figures yeah and you know we hold each other to account and that's the key thing yeah. and that's been a really powerful part of of me growing growing this business and being able to support other people in completely different sectors in, yeah in growing theirs as well and that's been great it's great yeah being able to give it to share advice even as you're learning yourself is really powerful i think because it's easy to see what we get wrong Absolutely. And the stuff we're learning. But the fact that, we, yes, I can acknowledge I've been doing this for a year or for five years or whatever, and I can actually share advice to other people. It yeah, can be really powerful. And, yeah. And, and, you know, I'm really interested in how problems get solved and how we tackle um, in tricky situations. Yeah. And there's, there's no right or wrong answer. But the one <laughs> thing that, that definitely happens is the same issues come up in lots of different types of businesses. So whether yeah. you're, you know, a publishing services supplier, a publishing company, a law firm, you know, or a cleaning company, yeah. you know, you're, there's enormous commonality in the issues that come up. So be it managing people, you know, getting sales, managing cash flow. Yeah. These issues come up across the board and it's really helpful and inspiring to see how, you know, how they can be tackled in different areas and yeah. with different solutions. So, yeah, that's been good. 
And is that is that how you tend to learn about the business? You, you rely on the, those people, that network you've put together, or do you kind of read business books and chase around the web for stuff? I am. Yeah, I, I do read business books. Um, I'm a bit of a sucker for, for that kind of content. <laughs> it's, it's been it's been useful to me. And one that really sticks in my mind is the E-Myth by uh-huh. uh, Michael Gerber. That's been... Um, really useful for me to dip into over the years. And that really talks about um, beginning with the end in mind. So uh-huh. you know, once, once we realized we had a business that, that we could, that we could grow and had potential, yeah. um, that book really helped me focus on what, what the objective was and really encouraged me to start running the business in the way we want it to be in, uh-huh. you know, in five or 10 years time. And, as a business owner and and uh, manager, it, it yeah. forces you to recognise all of the different hats that you wear. So, you know, at the beginning, you are the finance director, you are the yeah. technology head, you you run all of these operations. But if you recognise that, and if you kind of compartmentalise them, it's so much easier to hand those jobs off to other people when you've got the the size and the scale to do that. To be so, able to delegate stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It can be hard, can't it, when you're you're used to being in charge of things, of having to be in charge of things. It's one of the most difficult things, I think, especially in a business that's growing and you're getting more people, and you can't be involved in every one thing that's yeah. happening. So it's something that I'm particularly interested in at the moment. How we, you know, instill ethos and kind of behaviours that we want in in the people that are working for us, and and how we make sure leaders yeah. don't get too bogged down in the detail of every tiny project. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose, yes, you've got to help. You've got to delegate to people who you then want to delegate themselves once you reach that kind of size. Exactly. And that book really talks about that, you know, yeah. how you make sure you're laying those foundations for for, for future growth so that um, your structure and, and the processes that you put in place recognise where you where you want to be in, in 5, 10 yeah. or you know, 50 years time. So, so I mean, how big is the team that you've got there at Out of House now? So we've got 18 staff now. Okay. Um, we're growing and uh, I'm excited to announce that actually we're now part of a, a much wider um, network. So we're uh-huh. part of now part of the Nugent Knowledge Works group, which is um, a company based in Southeast India. Yeah. Um, Nugent have provided offshore services to publishers. And you've been working um, with across, them for years, haven't you? I've been working with them for more than 15 years. Yeah, yeah. long before I started out of house publishing yeah that's a and, that's an, um, a long established business relationship it's a good that's one of those things isn't it that these kind of these relationships you don't know where they're going to go but they're crucial you don't know where they get yeah you don't know where they're going to go but if they're founded on trust and you know a kind of a good uh, recognition of mutual interest and respect then i mm. think you know that that's the best possible foundation to to grow from and that's with you know, with vendors with with um customers yeah um and with authors as well, and you know, we we have to keep in mind the relationship that that our publishers entrust in us with their authors, and we yeah. have to make sure that we re- respect that and and hold that dear. And we're really proud to say that we work with lots of repeat authors, and we're often asked by authors, you know, for, for their publishers to place their work with us again, and that's a really that's a good sign, <laughs> really good endorsement that we yeah. you know, we really like to see. So that's, yeah. that's been great over the years to 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 build that relationship with with authors as well as the publishers that that we work with yeah so that th- this change you're making now you've been in business for well i just say growing over a period of 11 and more years you're now at a definite change point it's not it's not a gradual change there's, there's definitely something definite happening here what's the been the motivation for you to, to make this change say right we're gonna go and be more formally with new gen so um yeah we're as as you say we're a team of of 18 now here in in the uk um mm. with with us joining the Nugent group we we join a, a team of over a thousand people globally um in publishing professionals from from copy editors through to um people developing new technology yeah. and publishing is, a, is an industry that's you know that's always moved fast we've adopted new technologies and, and new platforms and new systems yeah. and that that is i think gathering pace and we see um real opportunities now to bring 
much more automation um, into the industry. So one of the, the key drivers for us is to be able to offer our customers better technology solutions. And we can do that through um, our membership of the of the Nugen Knowledge Works group. So um, you know, we're starting to look now at automating uh, elements of the copy editing process and, and mm-hmm. experimenting with bringing AI into that kind of area. Okay. Um, automating typesetting is, you know, reasonably advanced now for particular yeah. types of content Particularly and it's in that xml that, world that you you spend a lot of your work in yeah the majority of our content now is is delivered through an xml workflow to be honest whether the customer takes xml at the end of the <laughs> process or not so um you know, using technology yeah. to drive that forward and making sure we're offering our customers the very latest technology is, is a big part of that yeah um but also just realizing that you know we've grown very well in the uk and to some extent internationally but we've yeah. got a lot more potential um and we still think there's a lot of of room for uh marrying this yeah. um, onshore offshore kind of model and we want to really take that to to a much wider market and we can do that more um successfully we think as part of a a, a larger group yeah that makes sense yeah. So you were, you know, you started this journey as a, a lone, a lone freelancer, kind of eleven, twelve years ago. Is this kind of the kind of thing you thought you were going for? I mean, are, are, has House of House gone in the direction you thought it would over the last decade or so, or, or have you been like surprised by you know the, the the surprise turns that have come your way? Um, it's it's broadly been the the path that we. Uh-huh. That, that I that I kind of mapped out. I think the the one thing that's that's really taken me by surprise has been just the speed with which we've been able to grow. So uh-huh. you know, we really seem to have caught the market at a time when outsourcing production services yeah. um, has been a a real focus for for um, publishing companies, and that's you know the 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 big multinational academic and education yeah. publishers, but also some of the smaller. Um, startups who you know we we support publishers who have just two people running the business and they have no kind of production infrastructure at all and we yeah. provide all of that so at both ends of the market really we we've been really excited to see how how providing a really good efficient and high quality service has, has really kind of captivated um publishers imagination so that's that's worked really yeah. well it's interesting isn't it how it's almost, you know, you th- when you think of, a, of an XML-led ac- academic educational publishing service thing, you think, okay, that's aiming at the bigger companies who are outsourcing their stuff. But being able to say, actually, no, it, this tool this that we've built, this company, can solve problems for a whole range of people because the problems, to an extent, don't change with size, just the size of the problem. <laughs> yeah, was. absolutely, yeah. And, and you know, it, it, no matter how you, you come at it, the, the problem usually boils down to resource some mm. some limitation of resource either there's there's no resource at all <laughs> you know yeah with a startup okay we've signed up five books and we don't know how we're going to produce them um or you know a much a much larger operation but they have just been through an acquisition or they see you know 20 percent growth in their own volume of content for whatever yeah. reason and they they feel the need to outsource and that's usually where where we've got a foot in the door with with our customers and um it's worked well but yeah we're, we're seeing the the approach publishers are taking to outsourcing really broadening out now so mm-hmm. one of the other things that's taken me um somewhat by surprise is is that we're getting involved much further up um the workflow so yeah. we're involved now in commissioning titles in content acquisition okay. in manuscript development um and even in in you know, researching new products and developing concepts for okay. publishers. So effectively, uh, you know, you, you are doing the entire editorial production workflow now. Yeah, exactly. And you know, people have said to me over the years, well, you know, you're you're producing all these books. Why don't you just start your own <laughs> publishing company? And yeah, that's something I've kind of played with, yeah. thought about yeah. briefly over over the years. But actually, um, there's a real role now, I think, for supporting publishers with their entire operation. Yeah. You know, be it a particular type of product series or or area of work that they don't feel able to support in-house yeah. or um you know as we as we've said a small independent publisher who needs to outsource entire parts of their operation there are lots of things that that vendors like ours can provide 
um, outside of the traditional you know, typesetting and editorial production workflow, I think. And that's really exciting to think about. Yeah. I and mean, is, is that increasing variety of work something that that, that, that that you like, that kind of keeps you going? Because doing the same thing over and over again for 10 years sometimes gets a bit wearing. <laughs> well, I think it, it could get wearing if, if it was the same thing. Yeah. But what's been exciting for us is the growth. So managing the growth um, you know, in terms of cash flow, but also process and recruitment and building a team. So you know, I spent a lot of time over over these last few years thinking about how we you know, find really good people and develop a team. And hmm. you know, we spent a lot of time forming our senior leadership team and working on on operating as a team. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. So well, yeah. what is it that you personally find hardest about running a business? You know, you've been doing it for a while now, so I assume you've probably smoothed off most of the rough edges. But what's the bit for you that I don't know about that? There's always there's always something to work on, and I think it's <laughs> you know, it's it's juggling everything and and you know, avoiding getting pulled into every tiny bit of detail that's that's going on in the business. That's right. the the hardest thing, really. So um, every time that that takes me back to having a, a good strong team around me so uh-huh. you know, I'm, I'm really lucky to have brought some fantastic people into the team and we just we keep focusing on finding the right people and then once they're in the business helping them develop the skills and giving them the freedom that they need to do really good work yeah. um, so you asked about about books earlier on another mm. another author I've been particularly interested in is Ricardo Semler uh-huh. um, who ran industrial businesses in south america but he was really focused on employee freedom and you know running businesses with the minimum number of rules and okay. as we grow i'm trying to keep you know, bureaucracy and processes to the essential things only and giving our people the freedom to to grow yeah. um, rather than getting involved in micromanaging <laughs> and kind of controlling every yeah every individual aspect so that's that's tough getting that balance right um and uh so you know working on on delegation and building a good strong team are definitely the hardest but also the most rewarding (laughs) things that 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 we've been doing over the last few years i think yeah and what have you learned about yourself i mean you know 10 11 years is a long time so obviously we all change and grow over that time what have you learned about yourself as a result of running the business I think the single most powerful thing I've learned is that it's okay to ask for help. Uh-huh. Um, so you know, it, it wasn't really until I started to get that external coaching support um, yeah. that that I started to see the business in a different light and I started to really see the potential and see a, a route through to, to growing and, and building a successful business. Uh-huh. Um, so you know, asking for help is 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 not an admission of, of failure by any means and it's, yeah. a, it's a strength and that's something that you know i have to keep reminding myself from time to time and that I, I think you know i work hard to try and instill in the rest of my team as well that you know we we can look across a broad area of of, of support to to solve problems and and find solutions to challenges so we you know we can do anything yeah um, and we can we can solve almost any problem but you can't always do that on your own no absolutely yeah excellent and what what's the thing that in the face of <laughs> all those challenges and this, all, all the work that needs doing what, what's the thing that keeps you coming back to it every day um well i have a, a very strong sense of unfinished business so okay. um you know i i still think there's a huge amount of potential um, for our business to grow and to to keep supporting publishers with different kinds of services. And, you know, there are lots of publishers around the world, of course, that we don't work with. So mm-hmm. I have a strong sense that there's unfinished business here. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's a difficult business to, to make work. Margins are, have always been tight and are getting tighter. Um, you know, publishers' models are changing and that's putting a lot of mm. cost pressure through, through, um, through the entire industry, I think. So, yeah, there's a there's a real challenge there to find the right balance and to and to to keep pulling the levers in the right way to make the business work. Um, and yeah, there are always things that we can do better. There are, there's always yeah. room for improvement, and that's that's really what drives me on finding those 
those little bits that we can improve and, and develop to, to provide better services and solutions for publishers. Excellent. Well, that's a, an inspiring note to end the conversation. Well, thanks very much for your time this morning, Joe. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thanks again to Joe for that excellent conversation. I love the way that you can take an initial vision, you, know, you have a plan, and you grow that gradually over time, as Joe did. Even if you initially see yourself as a freelancer rather than anything grander, you can turn that into a scalable global business in slow, gradual steps over a period of years. And that the key step between viewing your business as a freelance one and seeing it as a viable business in its own right is getting external advice and coaching. I, I certainly find that the more I contact other people, the more I talk to other people, the better insight I get into what I'm doing myself. And that's, that's really interesting. And the focus that Joe has on becoming a high growth, high volume player by inserting himself into the workflow. But the, the, the compromises, the, the difficulties that come with that, of course, because you have to deliver savings to your client while also making a profit yourself. And I, particularly that, that wonderful piece of advice that even if you're too small for a proper board, you can still find a group locally to talk to, to get advice from, and crucially, to be held to account by for your performance against your plans. So thanks very much to Joe for that. that was, I thought that was really interesting. As usual, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like or subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your own podcast platform. It really does help people to discover the podcast. And come back next week when I'm talking to Asi Sharabi of Wonderbly about that business and where that's come from. So I hope to see you then. This was Talking Through My Hat, a podcast by John Pettigrew, founder of We Are Future Proofs. Please let me know your thoughts by leaving a review at Apple Podcasts or by commenting on the website, myhat.wearefutureproofs.com. You can subscribe to this channel at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our theme music is from hooksounds.com.